Hello and welcome to Scale by Intercom. I'm Liam Geraghty. Scale is our series where we discuss and share strategic advice from top support, marketing and sales leaders on how businesses are driving growth through customer relationships. I'm really excited about today's guest, HubSpot CEO Yamini Rangan, who is one of the most fascinating and influential leaders in tech. Prior to becoming CEO last year, Yamini served as HubSpot's first ever Chief Customer Officer, overseeing the marketing, sales and services teams. A tech industry veteran, Yamini has more than 24 years of experience, ranging from product marketing, sales and strategy, everywhere from Dropbox to Workday. On this episode, Anna Griffin, Intercom's Chief Marketing Officer, sat down to chat with Yamini. Together, they explore the key things you need to pay attention to for customer retention, how HubSpot is using the flywheel model to drive business growth and delight customers, how to really bring customer insight into every corner of your company, and a lot more. We know lots of companies use the Intercom HubSpot integration, and we have a lot in common in how we obsessively focus on customers. It's a fantastic conversation. So let's head over to the studio to hear Anna Griffin and Yamini Rangan discuss it all. Yamini, welcome to the show. We are so delighted to have you being a part of this with us today. I was excited, you know, prepping for the interview, just looking at your career and thinking about the incredible opportunities you've had to work with incredible brands, with incredible leaders and incredible technologies. And so for our listeners, tell us a little bit about your your career journey and how you got ultimately to HubSpot. Yeah, Anna, thank you so much for having me in your podcast. I'm a huge fan of Intercom and we operate in very similar markets. So really excited about this conversation, Anna. Yeah, I'll keep my career journey short. I think it's basically three phases. I started my career as an engineer. I was at that point fascinated by technology. It was pretty early days. I've left that far behind, Anna. But I will tell you, engineering taught me first principles thinking, really breaking down the problems into very manageable parts, thinking about systems approach and applying some principles to be able to solve complex problems. That's what I took away from my engineering career. And then from there, you know, I went to business school, post business school, found myself in tech sales. That was not an intentional choice. I thought I wanted to be a product marketeer, found a very, very cool opportunity in sales. And I said, why not? And it was probably one of the best decisions that I made, Anna, because it put me front and center in front of customers. And you sometimes, you know, don't get as much on a day-to-day conversation, but when you collectively get all those customer conversations and you understand buyer motivation, buyer behavior, buyer decision-making, and you're able to really get curious about, you know, customers in that deep manner, it has a pretty lasting impact on the career. And I'd say that, I was a very transformational, pivotal point in my career, just being in front of customers for a long time. And then the third stage, I would say, is probably the last decade that I spent with scaling businesses. I spent uh, you know, a bunch of time at Workday and Dropbox before coming to HubSpot. And both of those businesses were at the point where they were pre-IPO, really looking to scale go-to-market efforts. And I got to see how you connect the patterns across multiple years, across multiple geographies, and to be able to help organizations go through pretty significant scale. That's what brought me to HubSpot. You know, HubSpot is just a phenomenal company, very, very customer centric, and really obsessed about that buyer behavior and trends that I just talked about. And I joined as chief customer officer. My whole focus was to really drive what we call flywheel within within HubSpot as well as for customers. And then a year later, you know, uh, due to a lot of different reasons, I'm now the CEO of the company. And so I've been with the company for about two and a half years and super excited about where we are going over the next decade. Uh, you know, I was going to ask, making that transition from sales to, well, actually to product, to sales, to chief customer officer, or, or even business transformation and, and scaling initiatives. How does one make that transition then to CEO? But but you already answered it. That That is the magic pivot, that ability to know how those things connect ultimately 
makes for an, an incredible CEO experience. So you become the CEO of HubSpot. What was that like? Literally, like you're told you're getting the job. What was your first instinct? Oh, oh my God. Exceptionally emotional, partly because of my journey that I just walked you through, you know, growing up in India, growing up in a fairly small town, starting as an engineer and kind of figuring my way into go to market, aspired to do something great, but did not aspire to be a CEO of a public company of the nature that HubSpot is. And so just that journey kind of like flashed in front of me and that was emotional. I also think somewhat overwhelmed because if you have followed HubSpot, it's one of those incredibly iconic companies. Brian Halligan and Dharmesha started it about 15 years ago and they've built a truly amazing company with great culture, focus on customers and focus on crafted solutions. And it's a tremendous amount of responsibility to take something like that on. So the kinds of shoes that I was filling certainly caused some butterflies and really then comes down to, well, what can you do with something like that? The thing that you can do is to take something which has been, you know, just incredibly strong and continue to build that strength and to take some organization that has had a tremendous culture and continue to scale that culture, to take an organization that has been incredibly focused on customers and continue to scale that. And I'm really excited about that journey. Well, congratulations. You said something earlier that I wanted to go back to, and that was the flywheel. So you have this deep focus on you know customer success, how you can craft and do more for the customer for ultimately for their success, defining it ultimately as your own. And you guys have become masters at that. I'm sure that's made possible through the flywheel effect. So tell us more about the flywheel advocate approach. Well, Anna, before we understand the flywheel, you have to understand why you need the flywheel. And that is primarily because the approach before that was not working and has not been working for almost anybody within the industry. And that's the funnel vision. We call it the funnel vision. And Anna, you know this, <laughs> you've probably seen different varieties of pictures of funnel where you start at the top of the funnel and you you know generate leads and awareness and then you go from there to trying to pass th that to sales where sales will prospect discover negotiate close and then there is some kind of a virtual bell or a physical bell that rings because you win the customer well there are a bunch of issues associated with that type of a funnel vision First off, it puts marketing, sales, customer success at odds with each other. They're constantly fighting between each other in terms of the handoffs. No, I gave you great quality leads. No, you did not give me enough quality leads. Well, you didn't select the right customers. No, you didn't, you know, you've heard all of these. And so it really puts, you know, teams in conflict with each other versus really what they should be focused on is the customer. It's not really what the handoff looks like. It's who are they serving? And we think that there is something fundamentally wrong with that type of a funnel vision. And therefore, we came up with the flywheel vision, which in a simple manner, you put the customer at the center, you attract, you engage, and you delight those customers so that customers turn from, I don't, I'm not aware of you as a company, to I like you and I'll buy a product, to I am delighted by you and I'm going to advocate for you. And when you do that, when you put the customer at the center and you turn them into advocates, the flywheel spins and the flywheel gets momentum. And then you are able to attract even more customers, engage even more customers in delight. And so that in a nutshell is what we think is the right way for go-to-market functions to be customer focused rather than function focused. So important, particularly in a world where net revenue retention is the number one driver of enterprise value today. And it's on everyone's mind of, you know, how are we going to drive more customer retention? You know, having the customer at the center of your business model certainly makes that easier. But I would love for you to tell us your key drivers that you see. Like, if you really want to focus on customer retention, these are the things that, that you've got to pay attention to. 
Yeah. And, and, you know, one thing I really liked is the question focuses on customer retention. And this is like one of the fundamental things that have changed with SaaS, because in the world before SaaS, winning the customer was important. I think in the world that we live in with SaaS, retaining the customer is the most important thing. And so I think there has been this massive shift in terms of focusing on customer retention, which is you know, even more important. And and I, I'm not going to tell you anything that is fundamentally different about how do you drive that type of customer retention. It really starts with, are you attracting and engaging the right kinds of customers? And once they do sign up as the customer, are you onboarding them right? Are you providing enough support so they can engage with the product? And are you delivering ongoing value and if you do deliver that type of ongoing value, then you see it translate into great retention numbers. And so, you know, we think about going back to our flywheel, we think about what are the things that will fuel the flywheel and continue to drive that type of retentive motion that we're talking about versus what are the points of friction that will take energy away from the flywheel that will reduce your retention and reduce the value that you're delivering to customers. And so that's how we think about it. Fairly simple and basic, but sometimes the basics are probably the most powerful things that you have to get right. It's simple and basic, but in my mind, I'm imagining, you know, almost like a, a map or a massive diagram that shows, you know, every point of friction that must be removed or could could become a, you know, a hindrance. Do you ever graph your flywheel? I mean, is it something that you actually kind of prototype on you know, scenarios facing the business today and uh, possible future facing scenarios? Well, I, I think you're, you're talking about like a customer journey map of some kind. And I think that type of visualization is what we would all aim to do, right? For us, the journey for the flywheel started with something even more basic than having a visualized customer journey map. It's, you know, it started with what's the art piece and what's the science of driving this type of a customer flywheel. And I start with the art piece because frankly, art is really culture. And if you don't have the focus of the organization on the customer, then it's almost like you can have the most beautiful journey map and you can measure everything and nothing is going to change. And so we started with that and our cultural values start with solve for the customer. That's like literally the mantra that we have. It's the North Star that we have. Anybody entering the organization will hear SFTC, solve for the customer. Now, it doesn't stop there. It goes from there to monthly management meetings, starting with customer interviews and customer first meetings, weekly NPS meetings where we measure net promoter score, and also when we have a company meeting, a board meeting, we start with the voice of the customer. So I say that because it's deeply embedded within the culture of the organization. Now, the science part of it, and uh, quite different. We start with aligned teams. So we brought marketing, sales, customer success together into an organization, which we call the Flywheel organization. Then we created a strategy that was customer focused. So the winning aspiration for that team is really delivering delightful customer experiences. So it's not a marketing aspiration or sales aspiration. It's a customer aspiration. And then we align the right incentives, which are the key metrics that we measure. And we have the right systems to be able to provide that. And between that art and the science portion of it, we're able to drive that flywheel. And I say that these are basic and foundational because you have to get those right in order to then be able to visualize the journey and make improvements in specific parts of that journey. Fascinating. We share you know, a very similar thinking, and that is what we see at Intercom. And what we believe is you know, there is this blurring of sales, marketing, customer success, support, because it's become everybody's job to market, everybody's job to sell, everybody's job to support and create relationship and success with the product. And so the way that you've orientated, I think it's fascinating, but I, I bet you probably share a similar philosophy of us and it's everybody's job to engage 
is critical and to engage with the customer. It can't just be put in silos. So I'd love to hear your philosophy on modern day engagement. You know, what does that look like at HubSpot? Yeah, it's it's great. It's fascinating. I, may I ask you a question? How do you think of engagement at Intercom? I'm very fascinated by this. Engagement, you know, for, for so long, particularly in digital businesses, now that's we serve internet businesses. It's one way, or it's been, you know, more systems that reach out to you or omni-channel touch points, but it's very one way. It's email, but there's very few opportunities for real two-way engagement. And so we think about engagement as two-way in the product and in the moment when people actually want to talk to you, when they're thinking about your brand, where they where they want more than just a one-way push. They, they want to go back and we think that's you know, super critical because A, it's how you create human connections and human preference and understanding of each other, but but also it's how you get first party data. Yes. And in a world where first party data is critical. And so that first party data allows you to continually advance that engagement and that relationship based on what they want you to know, what they need, how they need to be anticipated and how they need to be met. So that's how we think about it at Intercom. And uh, I love it. I love it. And that's exactly right. You know, I started in CRM a couple of decades ago. And at that time, customer relationship management meant that you had a contact record for a customer. And I started as seller. So I would take that contact record. I would call that customer. I tried to engage in a conversation. And that's what CRM was for. Now, what you're describing is really the buyer's journey today, which has completely changed. And the buyer has so much more access to information. They could go to your website and look at your product. They could download a free product and engage with your product. They could go to peer sites and review sites and see what other customers say. And by the time they have the first conversation with the company, they probably even made their decision. And so the notion of engagement is really that just-in-time engagement that you're just talking about, which is, I'm not going to assume that the first conversation means I'm going to start with, here is what my company does. That first conversation is really getting a sense of where is the customer in their journey and what is the next best thing that we can provide to them that adds value for their journey. And so we think about engagement as really buyer empowerment rather than seller productivity, which is what the older school version of you know, CRM was all about. It's about seller productivity. And it, now it's all about buyer engagement and empowerment. And I think it's shifted pretty significantly. Yeah. And I think you're, you're dead on where you talked about the, the time of it. It's funny. I, um, my children ask, you know, mom, what do you do? Help me understand yeah. what Intercom does. I, I kind of don't get it. I said, okay, well, think about it. You know, if you're at McDonald's, you're, you're getting ready to buy your, your hamburger. When do you want to talk about French fries? In an email you receive two days later after you've left McDonald's? That's not the time to talk about French fries. The time to talk about French fries is right there in the moment when, when you actually want to engage. And what's interesting is, yes, that is a sales opportunity, but it's a sales opportunity on buyer's empowerment. Correct. You have to be there when they when when they want to talk about it. You know when, when they have the issue, when they have a a need, when they have and ultimately when you have an opportunity. So I love that. I'm sure your kids enjoyed that French fry uh, <laughs> as an example. My my kids will certainly do that. <laughs> so okay, so flywheel. It sounds beautiful, but for our listeners who are intrigued to try to stand something like that up when you haven't built a company. Clearly, you can have a company that's focused and has values on being customer obsessed. But for anyone out there listening, how would we get started with a flywheel approach in our business? What's your advice? I love this question. I think it's a completely fair question. I mean, you can certainly go all in and create the art and the science behind it. I think the easiest and the simplest way to start is to get something like a customer council built. Now, I'm sure you do this getting the marketing leaders, the sales leaders, the customer success leaders on a regular cadence talking about the customer. Because the first step to take in the journey, Anna, is really to go from functional thinking 
to customer in thinking. We think about, we say this is like customer in rather than function out. And in order for you to take that step of thinking about everything from the lens of the customer, just have to create a customer council of some sort, bring the leaders across marketing, sales, customer success, look at metrics that customers will be impacted by, not the number of leads and the ACV and you know, CSAT, but really look at it of how many customers visited on this particular website to add, add traffic and therefore you know, how many customers are actually engaging with our free product and how many customers are getting value out of the free product that therefore they look at upgrading. So really even think about the metrics from a customer perspective. And if you just did that, without doing anything else, you would still move the needle because now you've broken down the siloed functional thinking that creeps into organizations organically and takes it to a place where it is much more about the customer. That's the first step. Yeah, I mean, how do you guys bring customer insight into the company in a way that people who aren't customer facing can really get you know customer insight and get voice of the customer. Tell me some of the things that HubSpot does to make that voice of the customer accessible and understood. Yes, and I think we could talk a lot about this. I'm sure we can exchange best practices there. I would say that the voice of the customer cannot be one and done. It just needs to be everywhere within the organization to really drive that type of customer thinking within the organization. So we certainly do have a voice of the customer program and team, and that team's accountability is to bring both quantitative data about customers and their experiences, as well as qualitative data about the customers and their experiences. And I emphasize both of this because when you just look at numbers, you could look at journey and you make journey analytics in a really part of your process. You still don't understand what's happening with that particular customer persona. And so while quantitative information is great, you really need to marry it with qualitative customer feedback. And so the voice of customer team really does a brilliant job of that. You know, I mentioned a little bit earlier about our customer first meeting. This is literally the first meeting of the month. Most of our leadership team, the top, you know, our 40, 50 leaders are there and they're listening to customers. You know, this is, we serve small, medium businesses. And even within that, we have sub segments. And, you know, when you see a small, medium business person, they're like driving, they're multitasking, they have kid, you know, behind that they're helping with, you can see them in their natural space and you get how much of multitasking they need to do to run a small business. That's not going to come from any numbers. And that's exactly what, you know, the programs bring. So we do those types of voice of the customer. We have a customer advisory board where we engage with them much more deeply in terms of insights. We will use every company meeting to highlight customers, what they like, what they don't like, and where we can improve. And so there's this constant feedback loop across between customers and all of HubSpot that builds it into the DNA of the company. That's fantastic. Before we wrap, I do want to ask you, what's the future of HubSpot? Like, what are you going to be able to make possible next? What are you most excited about where you go, oh, just wait? customers. You have no idea the goodness that we're going to bring to you. <laughs> I, I, I love that question. I'm really excited. As you can see, we're in the middle of a transformation. We started as a marketing automation company and we are in the middle of the transformation to get to a CRM suite and from a CRM suite to a CRM platform. We really feel that providing crafted solutions to customers across marketing, sales, customer success and support so that we can enable this full flywheel. It's just a huge opportunity. Customers in small, medium businesses need it. We're excited that we're operating in such large spaces so that we want to be able to drive that. I also think stepping back in terms of HubSpot, you know, we care a lot about the culture and we care a lot about diversity, inclusion, belonging. So the next chapter is how do we continue to scale both from the culture and diversity perspective? The market potential is huge. I think we are 
seeing certainly acceleration in digital transformation over the last couple of years. But then this is just the beginning. There's just a lot more companies now that need to operate in hybrid worlds and need to continue to grow in hybrid worlds. And there's just tremendous amount of need and we're just excited. I think the next chapter is even bigger than the previous. Well, congratulations. I can't wait to see what you're going to make possible next. A shout out to your marketing team. I just want to congratulate you guys on that as well. As a uh, someone who follows marketing for a living, builds marketing for a living, I've always been impressed with the HubSpot brand, the marketing, the, the way that you engage prospects, the way that you work to educate. It's really world-class. So please give a shout out from our team to yours. Thank you so much, Anna. I really appreciate it. Our marketing team appreciates it. And thank you so much for having me on the show. I hope you enjoyed Anna Griffin's conversation with Yamini Rangan. If you did, we would love to hear about it. Let us know on social media. We've also had Brian Halligan, HubSpot co-founder and Yamini's predecessor as CEO on the show before. You can find a link to that episode in the show notes and the blog post for the episode. That's it for today. We'll be back next week. Thanks for listening.